Hello, oh, well. and welcome to Healing from the Ground Up. I'm your host, Robin Carpenter, and joining us today is Jeff Creek. Jeff is the co-founder of the Marin Carbon Project, and he's a director at the Carbon Cycle Institute, and he's here with some great news about what's been happening in the world of sequestering carbon in our land and our soil. Jeff, welcome. Thanks very much, Robin. It's great to be here. So I thought it would be great if you maybe started off a little bit about, um, and also you're a, 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 a rangeland specialist and a soil specialist and an uber scientist. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, my formal training actually is in rangeland ecology, and I have a deep background in organic farming in Marin County, um, which is, I think, part of how we came to this whole discussion. Uh, back in 2007, a group of us coalesced around the question of how agriculture in Marin might actually engage proactively um, and constructively with the climate crisis. Um, and really we were, thinking, we were thinking at that point about soil, um, recognizing that soil um, has a, is, is a potential vast storehouse for carbon and can hold a lot more carbon typically than, than it currently does. Um, and when soil carbon is increased, there are a whole raft of benefits that, that grew from that. So, with that understanding, we, we, we organized ourselves and um, approached Wendy Silver at UC Berkeley, who's a biogeochemist there, and, and asked for her help in actually doing some pretty hardcore research into this question. Um, and Wendy and was this very. started about. Sorry. Uh, you guys started three or four years ago? Has it been how long? We has actually been? started in 2007. In 2007. So it's been seven years. Yeah. Well, um, a lot's happened. A lot has happened. Yeah, a lot has, has happened, including um, Dr. Becca Riles uh, conducted her dissertation research on this very question and is now working in the Chesapeake Bay um, on similar questions. Um, what we really wanted to do, though, was determine how much carbon is in Marin County ag soils to begin with as kind of a baseline. And then we wanted to explore how we might increase that, how we might capture more carbon from the atmosphere through photosynthesis and get it into the soil. Um, one question that was sort of hanging in the air when we were discussing this as well, is that a good thing? What happens if we do that? What, what, what are the implications for our rangelands in Marin County? And we focused on rangelands because Marin is a, essentially a grass-based agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, we're basically a dairy and livestock county, and we have, we all know we have some produce production, but really we're a grass-based county. So we focused on rangelands, and so to answer the question of what might happen if we were successful, we decided to try putting some compost out on our rangelands as a way to see, one, whether we could measure an increase in soil carbon on grasslands, because there was some question about that. And the other was to see what would happen and would it be a good thing or a bad thing if we were successful. So uh, in 2008, we, after doing a very thorough survey of all the soils in Marin, all the ag soils in Marin, we put half an inch of compost out on, on uh, John Wick and Peggy Rathman's ranch in Nicasio. Mm -hmm. And then Becca Riles followed the results of doing that over the next four years while she wrote her dissertation and conducted her dissertation research. We also repeated this whole experiment up in the Sierra foothills at the UC experiment station there um, because we wanted to have a replicate that would mm -hmm. give us some confidence in, in our results. What was very interesting in the very first year, the very first spring, um, we saw a very significant increase in forage production on both sites on the compost treated plots. So that was exciting um, to increase forage. We knew we were capturing more carbon. Mm -hmm. Clearly that was happening. Um, we also saw an, a very significant increase in soil moisture, which was very exciting at the beginning of this long and enduring drought. Yeah. Um, and then we also were able to measure, and we saw and measured um, an increase in soil carbon. And that was particularly exciting because that was really the big question, was given the vast soil pool of carbon, increasing that a little bit, were we going to be able to measure that increase. Because over a large area, that's a lot. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So it turns out we could measure it, and that was very exciting. So then the question was, well, okay, that's year one. Should we put more compost on the ground and see what happens? And we decided, no, let's not put more compost on the ground. Let's follow this experiment out and see what happens next year. Next year, we saw an increase in soil carbon again. It was totally separate from the compost increase. That is, there was a ton of additional carbon captured by the growing vegetation above and beyond the compost carbon. 
we saw that again in year three, and we saw it again in year four, and we're now in our sixth year, and we've seen it again. So, Just by, that one application over the six years. Exactly. So what, what we understand now, what's happening, is that the compost so improves soil conditions and by, through both added nutrients, added moisture, overall improved tilth of the soil, that the, the standing vegetation was able to grow more. For plants to grow more, they have to capture more carbon from the atmosphere, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, using solar energy, turning it into their own protoplasm, and their own biomass, and that's how we transfer carbon from the air to the plant and then ultimately to the soil. Now in the soil, so the carbon is beneficial to have in the soil because doesn't it also feed different microbes and do like down there, so we captured it, but it's also doing good stuff down right, there. Exactly, so if you think about it, all of that ecology that's under the ground that we don't tend to think about, mm -hmm. which is incredibly complex and upon which we are completely dependent for our well-being and our, and our sustenance, all of that ecology is driven by solar energy but not through photosynthesis. It depends on the plants to do that work and Ooh. transfer that carbon dioxide through the plant into the soil. And it's, it's solar energy that uh -huh. drives that underground ecology. But, but it has to have the plant as the plant. like the transmitter. Exactly, exactly. So we tend to think of soils as feeding plants and supporting plants, but actually plants are feeding the soil at the same time. So there's this beautiful, you know, synergy going on. Was the there time. that, was that realization already in place? I mean, it was something new to me to discover that happening, or was this the first time that was really so clearly demonstrated? Well, I think we're, we, you know, anybody who's taken high school biology has studied photosynthesis, and we mm -hmm. all understand at some level that plants capture carbon dioxide from the air, use solar energy to do that, and solar energy then is used to transform that into sugars that the plant uses and which it also shares with the soil biology by through exudates in its roots, by its sloughing of parts of its roots, and through its own decomposition when, it, when its parts fall on the soil surface and decompose. So we know that, that's, that's, that's well understood science. The significance of that in the context of global warming though is something that has been largely, um, I won't say ignored, but has not been considered. And so I think what this research has done is it has really helped support the understanding that we have a tool that has about three and a half billion years of R&D behind it, mm -hmm. um, and it's called photosynthesis. And it, it withdraws, it pulls CO2 out of the air, turns it into essentially carbohydrates, which are, and all the things that we depend on for our well-being, our clothing, our food, our, our w lumber for, for houses, et cetera, et cetera all of our material needs. Um, and that is a, is a beautiful process by which essentially life is supported on the planet. Which is interesting because I was just reading something recently about developing a molecule that captures what, and, I, and once again, using high technology instead of looking at the power, the amazing power of Mother Nature. Because if you think about the Great Plains and the grasslands of America on a broad scale, and a half an inch of compost over all of that, what would that mean? Right. Can you maybe tell us a little bit? I mean, that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, we, we've, we've done the math. And um, if we were able to achieve this effect, this one ton annual incremental increase um, on all of the rangelands of the world, we could effectively stop global warming. Now, that doesn't mean we have to stop burning fossil fuels because we can't keep increasing that load in the atmosphere. But we do recognize that we have this incredibly powerful tool that if we engage with the carbon cycle under, with understanding and engage with all of the ways that we know as land managers, farmers, um, to, that we know about to increase capture of carbon dioxide, which is to say, how do we increase plant growth? Um, if we can do that at the global scale, we can draw down this, this surplus in the atmosphere. And very interestingly, the, the recent IPCC report International Panel on Climate Change report specifically calls out the fact that eliminating emissions, which we absolutely have to do, we have to stop emitting carbon dioxide from fossil fuel combustion. But the IPCC points out in its recent report that that is not going to stop global warming We've moved because we have it. already crossed a threshold. 
we already have too much CO2 in the atmosphere. So the question is, how do we get that out? And as you said, there are a number of very high-tech sort of geotechnical approaches being proposed, expensive, risky, untried, untested, dangerous. Um, but we have this beautiful intact system that we actually know how to engage with. Um, and so I think that's kind of the awareness that we're, the Carbon Project is helping to bring um, forward. And let's just talk a little bit about the compost. Where will that come from? And kind of the magic of compost right, in bacteria, right. because if we were to get everybody to really realize this on a global level and really start to want to implement this, what kind of compost and where does it come from and how does that piece of the puzzle work? Right, so, so compost is really an important piece in this, um, as, as our research showed, um, and compost is just the, any organic material that then goes through a thermophilic decomposition process, that is a high temperature decomposition process, and that temperature is generated by the bacteria themselves as they're breaking down that organic matter. So if you set up the right conditions, a compost pile that's properly built, mm -hmm. essentially, um, that pile then supports the growth of bacterial life and fungal life. And that, that activity results in heat, the generation of heat, and that heat then results in the killing of pathogens and the destruction of weed seeds. And ultimately, as that process then cools and finishes, you have a very stable, nutrient-rich, very carbon-rich material that can then be applied to the soil and used to enhance plant growth. It's the enhancement of plant growth then that drives that ongoing capture of carbon dioxide over time. Now compost is a beautiful thing and we know we're currently bearing about 30 million tons of organics in California landfills every year. Wow. So that's one place to get this organics and we have some recent legislation that's going to divert that material away from landfills. And now that we understand this process, we know where to put that compost once it's, it's made. There are other ways to capture carbon on working landscapes beyond compost as well. And we're looking at that. The Marine Carbon Project is now talking about what we're calling carbon farm planning, where we're, we're looking at a suite of practices, over 20 um, Natural Resource Conservation Service practices that um, are, are time-tested, tried and true, um, and we know that if they're applied at scale, can be as effective as compost in enhancing the rate at which we capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and move it through vegetation into our soil systems. Can you tell us a little bit about what some of those are? So for example, um, many of us in Marin are familiar with the Resource Conservation District's work over many years doing riparian restoration, mm -hmm. where we take degraded riparian systems and gullies and repair them through biotechnical approaches and, and mostly through planting, typically willows, other um, riparian species. And those systems then, because of the added moisture in those systems, um, are very, very productive systems. And over time, once those systems are restored, can accumulate enormous quantities of carbon. So over an 80-year period, for example, you could accumulate upwards of 40 tons per acre of carbon in a restored riparian system, um, which is, is a lot of carbon. And once again, in terms of drought and water, healthy riparian zones help the adjacent land. It helps to keep w the water system where you're not losing the runoff, where it's being stored properly. Exactly, and correct? you're sort of starting to get to what we're understanding now is that we, if we take a systems view of this and a watershed view of this, and we think about not only capturing water, but capturing carbon, which allows us to capture more water, this relationship between water and carbon is very close. And as we increase carbon in the system as a whole, whether it's through compost applications, improved grazing practices, riparian restoration, planting windbreaks and shelter belts, all of these strategies, um, we not only capture CO2 from the atmosphere, improve our soil productivity, we also capture more water and build drought resilience within our agricultural systems and our landscapes. So it's a, it's a multifaceted beneficial practice um, and concept. And we're, we're now trying to launch that, um, not just countywide, but statewide. What's interesting is because it, with climate change and because we're so, our atmosphere now, the amount of carbon is kind of hand in hand with droughts and extreme weather conditions. So the beauty of this is it's addressing both of those issues 
and challenges exactly. that are very, very much a threat to our food system and to our ability to be participants on the planet as humans. Exactly, and and it's I think it's easy to understand, or, or at least one can make the case that it's our failure to understand the carbon cycle that has led us to the brink of disaster with respect to our climate situation. Um, and we, we've thought we could just, you know, with impunity spew tons and tons and megatons of CO2 into the atmosphere and it would somehow be fine. And now we understand that that's not gonna work. Um, and then the question then, if we can, can become aware of the carbon cycle and, and our role within it as managers of that, um, we have enormous potential to reverse that negative trend and actually then engage with a very positive process by which we can increase food production, increase water capture, uh, increase biodiversity because again, if we understand carbon as solar energy, embodied solar energy, as we increase carbon storage in our ecosystems, we're increasing energy storage in our systems, we're making it possible for those systems to support more life, which is how we support biodiversity in our ecosystems. So, Carbon then pertains to just about every environmental issue that we're concerned with right now. And if we understand that, and we look at ways that we can manage carbon for the benefits, we can begin to address a whole raft of environmental problems through the active management of our landscapes, which is, for me, what's really exciting about this work. And you know, it's interesting as you brought in that, uh, what I think of a third disaster facing us, which is this sixth great planetary extinction so, so now you're addressing, you know, the, the carbon in the atmosphere, you're addressing the water issues, and you're addressing the diminishing biodiversity because of what we've done, that this is, so it's this really amazing, magical thing. Yeah. But how do you overcome the fact that everybody looks to technology right now, you know, non-Mother Nature things right. as the sexy ways to fix it? So is that kind of the next big challenge to raise public awareness and have political will around policies to back what you're discovering? Yes, I think you're right. I think that's exactly where things are. I think um, there's, there's a vast sea of what I'd say call, or has been called ecological illiteracy out there. Um, but at the same time, I think we're seeing a growing literacy in, in terms of what does it mean to be a living creature on this planet? Where, mm -hmm. What is our role in this in this landscape, and and the idea of human beings as active stewards of the landscape, I think, is appealing to across a broad spectrum, um, philosophical and political. I, I think we, I think most people, understand that fundamentally that is the human role on the on the planet. What that means in terms of how we behave, I think, is sort of is where we need to set some parameters for our behavior. The beauty of the understanding of the carbon cycle for me is that it, it shows us that this is not about constraining, this is not about limiting ourselves. Rather, this is engaging with dynamic living processes in order to enhance the capacity of these living systems to flourish. To flourish. Um, we do not have to deny ourselves, we can actually engage with these systems. As, as anyone who has worked for any length of time on a piece of land to bring it to, to health and productivity knows it's entirely possible to increase the productivity of a piece of land. And if we take that perspective globally, we can begin to think about restoring our, our dead and dying rivers and our mm -hmm. dead and dying sea coasts and the massive dead zone off our, off our deltas. Um, we do not have to be um, engage with an extractive economy. We could be building a circular economy, as um, Dame Ellen MacArthur has, has mentioned. She's proposed a circular economy in which everything is coming back to support and feed the system and continue to raise the system, elevate the system to a higher level of productivity. This is entirely within the realm of the possible. Um, we, have a, we have a history um, largely because we've had such abundance. Mm. Um, to draw from, but we have literally, with seven billion of, of us now on the planet, we have begun to see the limits to a linear extractive approach. And we need to start thinking about cycles as, of course, intact indigenous cultures have done for millennia, um, and that's how they survived for millennia, was by being essentially circular economies. Um, and it's time for us to, to wake up, basically, and get with the program. And you know, what you're saying is that 
because so much of the news has been restrict, restrict, we've got to lower, we've got to lower, and human nature doesn't respond well to that. <laughs> but when you say, we're going to expand, we, we have all these things we can do that are going to bring us a wealth, right. as well as solve our problems, yeah. that's far more exciting and far more appealing to expand the good, to push out the negative, as opposed to go to war on this piece of negative. Exactly, exactly, and literally go to war, because that's what we've done now, is we've, we've identified a finite set of resources that we have to have, and we're literally killing each other over them. And that makes no sense whatsoever. When we really have enough. Exactly, it's if we a, build a solar economy, a mm -hmm. circular solar-based economy, mm -hmm. that's a very strong platform to build a society on. So you're looking to expand through the state of California. And California is, you know, a very progressive state and really looks, you know, we look to solutions like that. Um, has there been discussion about how can we push this out beyond uh, reaching out to other countries that may be open to these kinds of ideas? What are some of the next steps that are happening in that regard? Well, I think this this awareness is global. I think this is a growing mm -hmm. awareness. I've, I've stumbled across um, similar ideas from many, many different countries. I mean, the web is full of similar ideas. Um, there's a group right now working out of San Francisco um, forming the, the Global Compost Project. And oh, wow. it's about building compost awareness globally. Um, and that's taking off. Um, so there is a lot going on. And, and it's very encouraging. I mean, it's a very hopeful time, as dire as things are. Um, it's exciting to see many people waking up to the possibilities of this you know, potential. Coming back to compost, one mm -hmm. of the things that fascinated me that I think you had explained to me in an earlier conversation was the process of composting cleans it. I mean, so that things that had, were issues, the magical process of composting, mm -hmm. like not wanting seeds or non-native species to get spread or not mm -hmm. wanting contaminants that really from what you're finding, that whatever's in there pretty much gets cleansed out. Yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing process. Um, there's been an enormous amount of work done around uh, the destruction of pathogens through the composting mm -hmm. process, the destruction of um, weed species through the composting, and it's an extremely effective, even the breakdown of some um, non-natural uh, materials. Like herbicides? Some, or things most like that? herbicides, not all. There are some persistent herbicides. Um, Dioxins have been shown to be broken down in the compost wow. environment. So you have this incredibly intense, biological, in, biologically intense environment. All this uh, activity, bacteria eating each other and, and eating fungi and fungi eating bacteria. And I mean, it just, it's this enormous thing um, going on in there. And these high temperatures, which most things do not survive high temperatures mm -hmm. well. Um, so it's a very dynamic environment. And then once it settles and cools and stabilizes, virtually all of that stuff has been totally transformed into some benign organic material that can then be applied safely to the soil. Well, it's an interesting thing too when you're thinking in terms of one of the things that sort of what I think of the side that's on the side of corporate greed and big agribusiness, like, well, we can't, you know, oh, that's pie in the sky. You can't fix the problems with the world without giant agribusiness and doing things the way we do it just bigger. Where in, I think it was two years ago that the UN, uh, the UN issued a report saying that the way to feed the world was not about bigger. It was about sustainable in their area, sustainable regional local farming and using permaculture and organic practices. Mm -hmm. would, mm -hmm. would We don't need to worry about that or have that as a hammer of our heads to make us do unwise things. Right, and I, again, I think it comes back to understanding the systems we're working with. Um, one thing I would say about carbon in agriculture is it does not require an organic approach. Um, this, this, the role of carbon is the same, whether you're talking about an organic or, or a conventional system. And the value of enhancing soil carbon in a conventional system is just as great as it is in an organic system. So you can sidestep so, the political tension so around that. Really, it's, it's really, it's, it's a, it's a important discussion, but it's a, it, it's really no need to draw that in because what we know is that um, conventional farmers will also benefit from an increase in, in soil carbon. And there are many, all the conservation practices we're looking at are being applied today on conventional farms. So um, 
And at the same time, I would say the National Organic Program is, has, a, has a flaw in its standards and mm -hmm. that the, the carbon standard in the National Organic Program is, I would say, very weak at best. Uh -huh. And so I think there's room to grow in the um, National Organic Program with respect to understanding the role of carbon. And it's ironic because when you look back at the history of organic farming and you say, well, where did organic farming come from? It really came out of an understanding of the role of carbon. But we've somewhat lost that in and the modern organic away movement. A little bit. And you think about what does it mean when we say organic agriculture? What is that referring to? It's referring to carbon. But you know, I think when you think marketing wise, how we think, we think no pesticides, no herbicides. Exactly. Exactly. But really, what organic meant, I know from my early hippie, crunchy granola days, is that it was about working within a system and working with exactly. Mother Nature exactly. and working yeah. in that way, which exactly. now we just have this organic standard so that we. Know that, but we, we should really be looking at what is a sustainable, regenerative way to grow exactly. our food. I mean, effectively, what we're asking is how do we transfer energy from the sun to ourselves? I mean, that's 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 really what agriculture is about, right? It's the transfer of energy, carbon, if you will, between carbon pools, as my friend John Wick loves to say. And it's clear that um, how we do that is by capturing, using the sun, capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, turning it into plant biomass, and then feeding ourselves. We have to do that whether we're talking about organic agriculture or conventional agriculture. It's the same process. The question is, are we conserving any of that carbon? Is, is enough of that carbon also staying in the system to feed that biodiversity in the soil and capture that water in the soil? We've done some math on this, and we think that we have more potential water storage capacity in the soils of California than we do in all the reservoirs of the state. So wow. when we think about the fact that we're going to lose our snowpack under a climate change scenario that we understand is happening now, the question becomes, well, do we spend billions of dollars to build reservoirs that may never fill because it may not rain, or do we focus on increasing the water holding capacity of our soils, which is a much more cost effective strategy. And then when it does rain, we can hold the water where it falls on the land for, for those drier periods that are gonna follow that. So Jeff, if people wanna find out more about what you're doing, where should they go? I would direct them to the marinecarbonproject.org website. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. And bringing us great news, happy news in the middle of people worrying about things. It's really very powerful news. And we hope that you'll join us again on Healing from the Ground Up. Thank you, Jeff.